Yes, uh, Assalamu alaikum and uh, good afternoon. Welcome to the series of uh, live talks that we're doing from Allen Hospital. So today, uh, my name is uh, Dr. Malik. I'm an endocrinologist and I treat mainly diabetes, thyroid, hormonal things, as well as osteoporosis. So the question today is the truth about osteoporosis. Are you at risk? How are we going to prevent it? And how do we as doctors treat it? So there are a lot of misconceptions about osteoporosis. Um, the first one I always hear in the clinic is, I'm taking calcium, therefore I cannot get osteoporosis. Now, this is a large misconception. Uh, a lot of times, calcium is a risk factor. Low calcium is a risk factor for getting osteoporosis. But just because you take a lot of it, it doesn't mean that it's going to prevent it. High calcium milk, anlin, others cures osteoporosis. Again, another misconception. It's a disease of the old, not really. Older people do get osteoporosis, but we also see it in younger individuals. Only females get osteoporosis. Again, a misconception. Men can get osteoporosis as well. So we will talk about some of these issues. There are a few questions that we've had, um, and I can answer them at the end of the, the lecture. But there are prepared, uh, there are lectures, sorry, there are questions that have already been asked, and uh, we have prepared for them. So let me give you a case. Now, this is a, a lady who is typical of whom I would see in the clinic. So let's say she's 69 years old and she presents to the clinic with sudden onset. That means very sudden back pain while carrying a flower pot. You'd be surprised. You, tell, you ask me, what is a 69-year-old lady doing carrying a flower pot? But in reality, I've seen patients carry big, large uh, tones of gas. I've seen flower pots. I've seen them carry all kinds of things from the market and so on. So this pain was very severe, very sudden. There's no history of fall. It was located between the shoulder blades, right in the middle of the back. And she could feel it going up and down the neck. When she li lie down, when she lay down, it was less painful, worse when she took a deep breath and when she tried to cough. Luckily, she did not have any pain anywhere else. And because of the history of fall, uh, no falls, there was no pain in the legs or anything which might suggest problems elsewhere. So this is a typical kind of patient that we would see. You know, when I see a patient in the clinic or even when we go out, we see patients who are very small, very frail old ladies. These are the people who are at risk of developing osteoporosis. Now, when someone has osteoporosis or not, a fall can lead to a fracture. A fracture means a, a, a break in the bone, and it can occur in the hip, it can occur in the spine, in the back, it can occur in the wrist. So the wrist bone is quite a common area when, uh, where falls can lead to fractures. So now let's go back to the history. Mrs. A, this lady that I saw, had menopause at 51. Now, early menopause, when you have menopause very early on, whether it's due to surgery, whether it's due to a natural menopause of le earlier than 40, pre this predisposes, that means this can lead you to have a problem with your bones. A strong family history of osteoporosis is important. If you have a first degree relative, meaning a mother, aunt, or somebody who has a history of osteoporosis, then it's very, very possible that you will develop osteoporosis. A smoker is more likely to get osteoporosis. Someone who drinks a lot of coffee, tea, more likely. L uh, low intake of milk and dairy products, that means milk, yogurt, um, butter, cheese, that kind of thing. Um, that will also lead you to have a low, sort of, uh, uh, low bone density. Now, 20% of patients, Chinese patients, cannot take milk. So you find that a lot of uh, Asians don't really like milk. And, you know, at this age group, when you're in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, it's very possible that, you know, when you were young, it was during the Japanese war occupation of Malaya. It was during a time when, you know, people couldn't afford to, milk was a luxury. 
So these kinds of things can actually cause problems later on. What you do to prevent osteoporosis is you imagine a, uh, you're keeping money in the bank. If you start young and you make sure that your bone health is, is good, then when you're older, you have more. But when you don't look after your bones, when you're younger, when you're older, you have less. And it's like keeping money in the bank. So now, there was no history of falls. Now, this is uh, fractures. This is very important because if you have a previous fracture, this makes it more likely that you, have, you will actually sustain a fracture in the future. So let's say you fell down from less than a standing height uh, and then broke a bone. Now, if this happens, this means that you have a fracture. So in the future, you're more likely to develop a fracture or a break in the bone than someone who hasn't had this. There's no history of prolonged bed rest. Now, when you're resting or lying in bed, you lose bone. So when you're exercising and doing heavy duty exercise, you don't lose bone. So this is the problems that, for example, astronauts have. When astronauts go up into space and they stay in the, in the, in the space station for a month, two months, they are floating around in no, zero gravity. So which means that there's no stress on the bone and they lose bone very quickly. So normal periods previously, very important because if a patient had no periods very early on, it implies menopause, which I was talking about. And this again uh, causes patients to lose bone. A, a female patient who loses, sorry, who sustains menopause, uh, as soon as they reach menopause, you can lose 30% of your bone within the first year. So this can cause problems, particularly if you already have a low bone density. Alcohol, again, uh, a big risk factor for osteoporosis, especially if taken in excess. And there are chronic medical conditions like asthma, uh, um, uh, what else, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, like Hongsip, that kind of thing, which can actually lead to osteoporosis. So when you look at risk factors, age, ethnicity. So if you're Caucasian, means you're white skinned, or you are Asian uh, of certain ethnicities, you're more likely to develop. For example, an Indian patient is less likely to have osteoporosis than a frail Chinese patient. Females more likely than males, premature, slender. The smaller you are, the older you are, the more likely you are to develop osteoporosis. So this is one condition where being overweight is helpful. Family history of osteoporosis, I've already said. Low calcium, uh, sedentary lifestyle, meaning you don't do very much, cigarette smoking, alcohol, caffeine. So these are the risk factors that we often ask patients about. Don't forget that uh, some medications can cause osteoporosis. So steroids, particularly traditional medicines. Now, a lot of times uh, patients will buy medications off the shelf, go and see a traditional, maybe Tanglang Sincere or whatever it is. And you know, when something cures you very quickly, you're in pain, you're given medication and it's cured miraculously, it's very possible that there are steroids. So any condition that is treated long-term with steroids can actually cause osteoporosis. So a low calcium intake in Asians is a, is a risk factor for developing osteoporosis. So if you have a low intake of less than 500 milligrams per day, you have doubling of risk of developing osteoporosis. Now, this is what I was talking about when you talk about age. This is a tool which we use in the clinic. But what I want to highlight to you is if you take someone who's 40, for example here, age 40, and you look at, sorry, age 40 plus weight. So if you're 40 and you weigh about 40 kilos, your risk is very low. But if you are, let's say, 90 years of age and you weigh 40 kilos, your risk of developing or the probability of having an osteoporotic Osteoporosis is very, very high. So small build, old age, as you get older, it's actually very important. So when we look at someone who has osteoporosis or think has osteoporosis, we always look at age and we look at the weight. So the smaller they are, the more likely that you're going to have problems with osteoporosis. So when someone presents or has problems with a fracture like, like our patient here, Usually what happens is this is a progressive disease. What patients tell me is that when they come to the clinic, they will tell you that, okay, um, my skirt is longer. My trousers are longer. I used to be able to reach uh, the cupboard. So now I can put my hand up 
and I cannot reach the same height that I could reach before. So patients feel that they have lost some weight, they feel a bit breathless, they have pain, and they have difficulty in sleeping sometimes because it's painful all the time. So the bones are painful, you're aching, you just don't know why. And aching can occur because of what we call micro fractures. So you may not see a fracture on the x-ray, but in actual fact, you, you if you do a, you know, a specialized CT scan or something, you may see micro fractures. So this is what causes the chronic pain that patients feel. So they may have pain in the spine because of crush or compression. So you imagine if your spine goes like that, then you'll find that the patients actually feel the pain. And sometimes rib fractures can occur. I push you, they, you know, they, they're suddenly they're carrying their grandchild and, and the grandchild just twists a little bit, a, a rib can crack. And this can cause pain, which is very, very severe. Most commonly, patients actually lose height. So if you look at your grandmother, uh, uh, you'll see that wow, progressively over a period of time, they're becoming shorter and shorter. They are more hunched forward. So when they're hunched forward, the back pain occurs, the, 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 the height is lost, and they have breathing difficulties. The tummy is sticking out more. All of this because of what we call the loss of the curvature of the spine, which is the natural curvature. So now back to our patient. When I examined her, the pain was better when she was lying down. But when I pressed on the spine at the back, there was a lot of pain and muscle spasm. And she said, oh, bongo, onku. So she's saying that, oh, I, I feel that uh, I've, you know, I'm getting more and more short and the loss of height of six centimeters. So how do we know whether patients have lost height or not? You know, the easiest way is you measure your arm span. If you measure your arm span, you can actually get an approximate idea of what your height should be. If patients have records, we can use the records. So measure the arm span, measure the height, and if there is a big difference, yes, they have lost height. So now the question is, does my patient have osteoporosis? She's an elderly lady who suddenly developed back pain while doing some lifting. Well, we think she has osteoporosis, but usually what we do is we examine, we do some tests. Now, if you're sitting in the middle of jungle somewhere, in the middle of uh, Kalimantan or sitting in, in the middle of uh, Guamusan somewhere and there's nothing, no way of getting any test done, any old person who presents with a fracture or, or pain as I've described to you is most likely osteoporotic. But, you know, if you have access, that means you can go to a hospital, see a doctor, get some tests done, then it's important that we actually do some tests. Now, usually... We do various tests. How do I go back? Okay, got it. So we can do various tests. And sometimes we do x-rays. And x-rays are important. But x-rays can only show change of osteoporosis after you've lost a lot of bone. So when you're looking for proper testing, we're looking at bone mineral density testing, which is basically what we call a DEXA scan, D-E-X-A, D-X-A. This is a, a machine that measures bone density, kepadatan tulang. And this will tell us whether there is osteoporosis or not. Sometimes we do blood tests, we measure, you know, we look for various causes of, of osteoporosis. We can check vitamin D, we can check calcium and so on. Um, and then, you know, if we think that there are other causes, your doctor may order even more specialized tests. But at the very basic level, we would do what you would normally do in the clinic, a full blood count, check your hemoglobin, check your calcium level and, and so on. So back to our lady, uh, x-ray showed that she had multiple fractures, blood tests were normal, but what you must understand is having a normal calcium doesn't mean that you do not have osteoporosis, okay? So when you check your calcium, everybody's very happy, wow, my calcium is okay, I don't have osteoporosis, but in actual fact, the two may not be related to each other. So if you look at my patient now, there's many, many fractures. I don't know whether you can see this on Facebook, but this is a wedge shape. That means you see this side here is bigger than this side. So what it means is that the front here has become smaller because of compression. And this is a compression fracture. And we see this throughout the spine. So when you have many of these, particularly in the back and the mid spine where the pain has occurred, patients tend to be bongo, they lean forward. And that's what causes the loss of height. So this is a DEXA scan. Uh, it's a bone density scan quite commonly used to measure bone density. 
and this will give you a report that looks something like this. So your doctor is able to look at this and say, well, one, you confirm that you have osteoporosis. Two, I can tell you your fracture risk, whether you know it's a very high fracture risk or a low fracture risk. And basically, um, having these kinds of scans are useful because after I give you treatment for your condition, we can monitor your progress in a year or two. We can repeat the scan and see whether any of the medications I've given you has made a difference or not. So in conclusion, our patient has osteoporosis. So you can see that in a normal bone, every bone structure, this is called trabecular bone. So they are connected to each other. And when this is like, you know, when you go to Hong Kong, you've seen the Jackie Chan movies where they have painting the building and there's scaffolding. So this is what is holding the, the bone together. But when the scaffolding, which is holding the bone together, the trabecular bone is broken or reduced, then what you, what you will see then is basically the chair, like for example, if you take a chair, a chair which is, has four legs may have little connectors to prevent the legs from shaking. But if that is broken, then the, 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 the chair becomes wobbly and you can fall down. So this is the concept that we tell patients that that is osteoporosis and that will cause your bones to collapse. So osteoporosis basically is reduced bone strength and what having reduced bone strength is not a problem. The problem is that it actually increases your risk of fracture. Now, a lot of many years ago, people used to say that, wow, having a fracture, no problem, it's only a broken bone, man. But what we know now is that if you break a bone, for example, your back, a lumbar spine or your thoracic spine or even your hip, the risk of dying from that osteoporotic fracture is even much higher than cancers. In older people, it can be very, very problematic if you break a bone. So we are trying to prevent that bone from breaking rather than to treat someone who has already got a broken bone. And if you treat someone who has a fracture, you need to get them mobilized. That means walking up and about as soon as possible because lying in bed waiting to recover can cause other medical problems. So when we treat someone who has osteoporosis, main thing is we need to give pain relief. That means we provide any kind of medication and mobilize early. That means we need to get your patient walking. If it's a spine fracture, we try. If it's a hip fracture, patients may need to go for surgery immediately. And within day one or day two, the next day, patients are already walking because the longer you do nothing, the more problems you're going to get. So physiotherapy helps. Now, more importantly is if you don't fall, you don't fracture. So what we need to tell patients who are at risk of developing osteoporosis or osteoporotic fractures is don't fall. Because if you fall down, then it's going to, you're going to break a bone. And if you break a bone, then all your other problems will start. So how do you prevent falls? Well, proper footwear. Tell your patients, make sure that they don't walk around in six-inch stiletto heels. Yesterday, I had a lady who has severe osteoporosis, but still insisted on wearing high heels. So high heels means higher risk of falling down. In the house, if you're walking, um, a carpet, loose carpets, very dangerous. Carpet looks nice, but if you trip on the edge of the carpet, you're going to fall down. So same thing in the bathroom, make sure there are tiles somewhere to hold on. So simple things, night lights, make sure that the patient can see where they're going. Because if you cannot see, then you're more likely to fall down. Calcium, vitamin D, medications. Now, medications don't cure osteoporosis. They reduce fracture risk and take away some of the pain. So the importance of that, I will talk about in the next few slides. But basically, there are medications which we can use, which can help reduce the next fracture by almost 50%. So it's important that you understand that when we treat, it's not about treating, you, you take maybe 20, 30 years to develop osteoporosis, one tablet is not going to cure it. It takes many years to treat osteoporosis. So how do we treat? Well, lifestyle changes, very important, diet, exercise. So we tell patients, look, if you're doing exercises, um, you need to continue doing your exercises, not when you're in pain, but after that or before that, if you dance, for example, uh, Indian, Indian dancing, the Bharatanatyam, whatever, percussion dancing, line dancing is good because it's low impact to medium impact. And this stresses your bones and causes the bones to become stronger. 
If you jog, that's fine. Swimming does not help osteoporosis. Cycling to a lesser extent because there is no impact on your bone. Those are good for your heart, but they are not good for your bones. So skipping may be good for your bones. You need to take adequate calcium and vitamin D. And sometimes we use medications and the medications are of various types. There are serums, uh, calcitonin, which is hardly used anymore. We have vitamin D. We have uh, some medications called bisphosphonates like uh, Fosamax, for example. And of course, we have injectable prolia, which is injected every six months, or fortioteriparatide, which is injected every day. And this is used for patients who have very, very, very severe osteoporosis. So most patients need to take about 1,000 milligrams of calcium per day, which means that this is total daily intake. So if you take a lot of milk, you take a lot of soy, you take you know, foods that contain calcium, then you don't need to take calcium in the form of tablets. But if you're drinking, for example, if you're overweight and obese and you have a lot of other problems and you drink milk primarily because you want the calcium intake, then you can actually use calcium, maybe one tablet a day after food, and you can use other forms of supplements, for example, I mean, or, or, or dietary intake to make sure that you take about 1,000 milligrams per day. There are many forms of calcium that are available in, in the market. Calcium carbonate is what we would recommend. There are a few brands, Decal, Cal, Caltrate, whatever it is. You don't need to use calcium citrate, which is very expensive, and you don't need to use calcium lactate, which has very low calcium uh, in it. So basically, one tablet of calcium carbonate plus D should be more than sufficient if you go out in the sun and so on. For vitamin D, we recommend about 800 units per day. Some people need a bit more, maybe about 1,005 to 2,000 per day. So again, your calcium plus D should be sufficient, but you need to spend about 15 to 20 minutes in the sun. Morning sun, whatever, don't want to get dark, just roll up your sleeves. Spend some time in the sun. It helps you actually build up vitamin D levels. And vitamin D is important because calcium and vitamin D helps build bone. But if you're already 50 or 60, it's not going to prevent osteoporosis. You need to take calcium. Make sure your children and grandchildren take calcium properly and they have enough milk intake now to prevent osteoporosis later. But if you're already in the 50s and 60s have osteoporosis, it's not going to prevent or cure your osteoporosis. It's too late. Okay, the next question is, how long do we need to treat? Well, you have to understand that treatment is actually long-term. As I said to you before, we talk about years of treatment, two years, five years, 10 years. All the medications that we use now have been used for at least five to 10 years. So we know that these drugs are quite safe. We know that generally speaking, if used properly, they reduce fracture risk. So treatment is long term, not for one or two weeks and then that's it. So if you look at the studies that have been done in the US and other places, most patients do not continue treatment after even six months. And this is wrong because this is what is going to actually prevent that next fracture or reduce the risk of that next fracture from happening. People talk about cost, but you, you know, to worry about the cost of treatment of medications, you have to understand that at the most expensive end of spectrum, uh, 40 of teriparatide, it may cost you about 1,700, 1,800 ringgit a month, but this will actually build up your bone in such a big amount that it reduces your fracture risk. If you break a bone, need a hip replacement, you're talking 30, 40,000 ringgit. So you're basically treating to prevent those problems later on. There are many choices of medications, and basically you need to follow your doctor's advice. Uh, there are different types of medications for different types of patients. So, you know, a, a proper consultation, proper assessment is important. Now, when do we start? If you have a hip fracture or a history of fracture, that implies you already have osteoporosis. So, if you're postmenopausal, after menopause, or a man who is older, we will treat. We use DEXA scores and we use other scores. So, basically, if your risk of developing a fracture in the next one year, next 10 year probability of fracture is high, we will treat rather than wait. So there are many choices of medications. And what we're trying to do is build up bone strength. That means make sure your bone is quality as well as bone density. 
So there are many, many choices of medications in, uh, in the market. As I said, proper assessment will allow your doctor to choose the right medication for you. Bisphosphonate is very commonly used. And, you know, really, if you go into the lay press and look at some of the things that have been said about these medications, um, a lot of it is sensationalization. These are the medications that we have been using for 20, 30 years. With some, you know, There are problems with them, but generally speaking, this is the backbone of therapy. We use these kinds of medication to treat the majority of patients. This is a new one, Prolia. Um, a, a majority, uh, many patients are actually on Prolia injection. This is very convenient. It's a 60 milligram injection delivered in a syringe form every six months. So when you look at cost of treatment compared to cost of daily therapy, it's more or less the same. So I prefer to give my patient a six monthly injection. Then they don't have to worry about taking medication, uh, taking, you know, having gastric side effects and so on. And it's so convenient because you do it only twice a year. And it's not more expensive than any of the usual medications that we use. Now, when we use some of these medications, they are called anti-resorptives. So what we're doing is when we're treating with an anti-resorptive, you've lost the bone. We try and maintain whatever you have lost. And to a certain extent, we try and help you gain some bone. But there is a new class, well, not new, but there is a more powerful class of medication called anabolics. Anabolics basically are agents or, or medications that help build bone very, very prolifically. That means a lot of bone can be gained. And this is what we use for patients who are very, very severe. So if you look at the medications that are available, the first one was this one, teriparatide. Um, there are a few now newer ones beyond this, but not available in Malaysia yet. These are injectable. These are injected every day. Uh, like we use for, you know, this is the needle we use for insulin. So once a day injection, you can build bone in, in about two years, you can build about 20% 20, 20 bone gain. So that's very, very significant. So if you look at this, severe osteoporosis, severe osteoporosis, a lot of pain treated with normal medication. I gave her the teriparatide and she did remarkably well. So basically what I've tried to show you is that what I've we've discussed is the fact that one, osteoporosis is a chronic illness. Two, proper assessment is necessary. It doesn't go away. It needs to be assessed, needs to be treated. And if you don't or you ignore it, then you're going to have problems later on. Treatment is possible. Patients should continue medication. And whenever possible, you should have regular clinical assessment, meaning that you have to see your doctor. You can't sort of say, oh, Okay, he started medication already and I might go to the pharmacy and just continue the medication. doesn't work that way because sometimes after a year or two, we need to change medications. It's not as simple as all, as all that, but the, the, the reassuring part for you as a patient is that treatment actually reduces the fracture risk. And that's very important because you don't want to have another fracture if you already have had one. So in conclusion, osteoporosis can happen in both men and women. It is possible to detect early by screening. So, you know, the executive health screening programs that we have, uh, you know, uh, they all actually allow you to get a DEXA scan done very cheaply and effectively. And this can actually tell us whether there's a problem or not. Treatment is possible. And ultimately, some patients may require surgery, but the majority may end up just taking medication. Treatment is long term and it's absolutely necessary to prevent that next fracture. So, a few questions here that have come in. Um, I'm 58 years old. I have uh, osteoporosis. I read that jogging is one of the best exercises for building bone. Is running considered safe? Okay, now, um, first issue is that any form of weight-bearing exercise is important. So, is running considered safe? Um, it depends on how you run. Like if you run like you're running a marathon, five minute, you know, if you're running crazy, crazy speeds and, and all that, then it's possible that you may fall and fracture. So what we normally tell patients is work, run at your own pace, comfortable pace. <clears throat> if there's pain, you need to consult. But generally speaking, start with brisk walking and then build up slowly as time goes on. So don't, Today, I diagnose you with osteoporosis. Tonight, you are inspired and tomorrow you go jogging at high speed. Nola.
So you need to be properly assessed and like anything else, you need to train yourself to get better. How can I find out if I have osteoporosis? As I said to you, there are screening programs that are available. Um, personally, uh, I think, you know, when I came back from UK 20, 20 years ago, we didn't have bone density machines in the country. There were hardly any at all. I was working in Kota Baru in those days. And, you know, the closest machine was in Kuala Lumpur. And to get somebody who had a density scan done is like, wow, a very big thing. Now, in Penang alone, every single private hospital has one. We've got one, uh, Logon Lai, anybody, everybody has one. So it's very easy to get a bone density scan. Sometimes you get uh, heel ultrasounds done. Sometimes you get forearm scans done, that kind of thing. Those are probably not as accurate as the bone density. So the bone, the, the bone density scan that you find in hospitals, the DXA scan, this is the gold standard. And this is how we diagnose it. We don't use the other machines like ultrasound, etc., to make a diagnosis. Can osteoporosis be reversed? Osteoporosis, generally speaking, um, when we treat someone who has osteoporosis, what we are trying to do is basically improve bone strength. So if you look at the current guidelines, we start with one form of medication, but we can switch. Once you are better, we can, we can actually go to a different, less potent kind of medication. So can it be reversed totally? Cured? Probably not. Can it be reversed to a point where patients improve significantly? Yes, definitely. Which foods provide high source of dietary calcium besides milk, milk base? A lot of vegetables, some fruit, um, ikan bilis, that kind of thing. Um, I can't give you a comprehensive list, but you can just go online and Google this, which calcium rich, calcium containing foods are available. A lot of times it not necessarily has to be milk. It can be vegetables, etc. as well. I have no family history of osteoporosis. I eat, right? Uh, how did I get osteoporosis? Well, basically, you know, there are many risk factors for osteoporosis. So one, a family history is one risk factor. I ex exercise is, is another one which prevents it. But, you know, you may have been sick as a child. You may be one of those unlucky ones who loses more bone after menopause, that kind of thing. So sometimes... You, we, as with any other disease, you never know why you got it. So th the point is that don't worry about why you got it, but focus on trying to get better rather than worrying about why me. What is the difference between osteoporosis and osteoarthritis? Osteoporosis basically means um, uh, losing bone. So the bones become por porous, become thin, and they become more in, uh, susceptible, more, more, more likely to fracture. Osteoarthritis, this is kuche kuchi. So osteoarthritis basically is uh, degenerative. It means, you know, sometimes you've got not enough oil in your, in, in, in your gel in your knees. Maybe you've got back pain, hong sip, whatever it is. So this is arthritis, hong sip. This is osteoporosis, is kuche. Sile si kuchi. Okay, I feel hopeless about living with osteoporosis. What do I do? Now, um, we always tell patients, look, be careful. But it doesn't mean that you you have to walk around in a, in a full body cast all your life. It doesn't work that way. So you if you fall, we treat. And we if there's a fracture, we treat. But basically what we're doing is trying to encourage you to live as normal a life as possible but you have to take preventative measures. That means prevent falls. If you cannot walk for long distances, use a wheelchair. If you go to the toilet, make sure that, you know, if there is a handle there to help you pull you up. Uh, if you need assistance at night, if you're older, maybe, you know, the, the, your maid or helper or somebody can help you sleep with your caregiver, can sleep with you to prevent you from falling down and to, you know. So there's a lot of things you can do. Osteoporosis is often associated with uh, depression. So... Sometimes we treat the depression to make you feel more motivated. But it's not about, it's not a death sentence, you know. Just because you have osteoporosis, it doesn't mean that life is, as you know it, should end. So there's a lot of things you can do and probably you need to consult your doctor and see where they can help, he can help you or she can help you. I heard osteoporosis leads to bad posture. Is this true? Now, bad posture and osteoporosis don't go hand in hand. Sometimes you can be bongo because of the way you sit down at the desk, uh, you know, that's posture. So you need to roll your, your, your back and all that. 
But having said that, osteoporosis with multiple fractures can lead to uh, a, a leaning forward, a stooping, stooping sort of thing. So two things. One, osteoporosis can lead to a bad posture in a way. That's true. But generally, bad posture does not always be, is not always caused by osteoporosis. When should I consider seeing a doctor about being evaluated for osteoporosis? Generally speaking, at the age at menopause, okay, if you have high risk factors, multiple risk factors, meaning that you had asthma, you're on steroids, you've got chronic diseases, then maybe even earlier. But generally speaking, all post-menopause, as soon as you reach menopause, you should be looking at your bone health as well. So if you are concerned, you can check a little bit earlier, but definitely at the time when you reach menopause, because a lot of the treatments, in fact, all the treatments that I've described to you earlier are all only for people who have, have post-menopausal osteoporosis. That means to receive treatment for all of these conditions, osteoporosis, basically we're looking at post-menopause, after menopause. In men, again, there's another set of criteria, but uh, generally speaking, in older individuals. Does osteoporosis have any warning signs? Um, not necessarily. The signs that come are often pain or after something has happened. So if you are someone with a, who have risk factors, you can look at the International Osteoporosis Foundation, IOF. IOF has a website and they have a questionnaire. So you can tick and see whether you are at risk. If you are at risk based on that questionnaire, then basically you need to be screened rather than not be screened. So any warning signs that is going to happen, often there aren't any. If there's pain, sudden onset of pain, you're losing height, you feel that you know, you're very thin and, and you have rib pain and back pain and all that, then you might as well, it's better to just get it checked. So with that, um, I'd like to thank you very much for listening. Um, and I think it's question time. So if you have any questions, feel, feel free to send it to, to us. Thank you. No questions? Oh, okay. Okay, thank you very much.